Hello and welcome to the Thursday Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by the man who is the main reason to listen to the Total Soccer Show. <laughs> it's Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. I'll say 50% of the reason to listen. I'll All take right. that much. I'm 49. Okay. Wait, what? <laughs> So we are here today. You went from generous to mean real quick. <laughs> you just can't, you can't predict it. We're here today to talk about MLS 2017 mm-hmm. and the 10 reasons why you should watch. Mm-hmm. It might not actually be 10 reasons. No, I think it'll be a couple more than that. Because we're a little bit like over-researchers, mm-hmm. over-achievers. I bet we have more than five each. I bet we do too. And <laughs> we, we also got some suggestions from Twitter. That we do. And if you wanted to listen to a more maybe specific prediction-esque preview show yeah. about maybe, say, the Eastern and Western conferences, <laughs> then you could do that by listening to our two most recent shows. Yeah. Yep. In which we did just that. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start with the question, though, Tyler. Sure. Why are we doing this? Why we are we doing this? Yeah, because we don't have, like, ten reasons to watch the English Premier League. We do not. Or ten reasons to watch the World Cup. I think it's because uh, with the Premier League, like, we kind of have this, like, kind of already big familiarity with yes. most of the teams and with a lot of what's happened because you get so much publicity about it and press about it going into the season. Yep. Um, with Major League Soccer, I think you don't necessarily get that amount of coverage in a lot of the mainstream media. So mm-hmm. it's, like, a, and then it's also a lot of the names aren't as high-profile as, say, Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Paul Pogba. <laughs> it's, it's still... But they're still very exciting names, and so I think with that background, when we do our previews, we're trying to kind of like cram in as much information that we've learned because there's all of these moves and all these transactions and yeah. formation shifts and new coaches and roster adjustments, and it doesn't really allow for just kind of like a step back and being like, wow, there's a lot of things to be excited about. Well, here's, here's the reason for me. Mm-hmm. I'm more excited this year than I was mm-hmm. last year. I was more excited last year than I was the year before. I agree. Yeah. And I also think there are a lot of people out there whose um, perception of Major League Soccer is very, I guess you call it MLS 1.0, like mm-hmm. maybe a, a year 2000-ish perception. Um, and I honestly think the league has improved and changed so much in the last few years mm-hmm. that it's worth making the case why soccer fans, especially in the United States, should watch MLS in 2017. Now, here's my question. Uh, do you, When you say that, like the soccer fan 1.0, 2000s MLS, do you mean in terms of the way they MLS view... MLS 1.0. Okay, sorry. In the way they view the league, like those individuals, the way they see the league and the way they, like their expectations of the league? Or yeah. do you mean they're kind of like, oh, MLS isn't very good soccer. Like, both. Yeah, I, both. I okay. think, I bet there are soccer fans out there, mm-hmm. probably people listen to this to this show, mm-hmm. some people obviously who aren't, um, who think, when they think of MLS, they think of the crazy uniforms yep. and like the KC Wizards mm-hmm. and the gridiron playing on artificial turf with uh, the NFL markings. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and honestly, some, some not very good soccer and like teams folding and mm-hmm. half empty big stadiums, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And things are very different now. They are. Or they think of retirement league and things like that, which I'm going to make the case one of my reasons is that that is not a thing mm. anymore. No, it is not. Mm-hmm. I think in, very intentionally so. So yeah. should we get to that then? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I've, I've talked enough, I think. Okay. I'll turn it over to you for the first reason to watch Major League Soccer in 2017. Okay. Uh, I am going to go homer on this one. I, I'm a DC fan. We're going up to see DC United's home opener this weekend. Yes, we are. And so I am very fascinated by the development of Ian Harks and what Ian Harks is going to bring to DC United. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't, I really didn't like, I kind of divorced myself from John Harks and DC United for mm-hmm. some reason. So when you mentioned that, I was sort of like, oh, right, duh. Like, father is a legend of DC United. Right. And I think I was a little bit down on him as a result. Maybe not as a result, but it didn't have that sort of weight in my mind when I did that DC United preview. Yeah. And I and with that is that I didn't think that he was going to be the starter. He may not be the starter. But he's going to be there or thereabouts, yeah. It seems like he's going to be, I would say, by midseason starting as a number eight or a number ten. Mm-hmm. And I think... There are going to be various reasons for that. Yeah, maybe maybe so. Although, yeah, I guess it could be anywhere in the midfield. But I think basically everything I've read indicates that he is going to be a very solid performer for DC United. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I was basing my sort of like kind of like calm, I'll say, feelings on him because it felt like a lot of people were watching clips of him, like a certain clip here, a certain clip here from college, and just being like, oh, he's amazing. And we've watched enough YouTube videos of people who then don't pan out to be skeptical of that approach. But to hear people who've seen him play, they're very optimistic. All right, I'm going to broaden your point out mm-hmm. as well, so it applies to everybody. Um, MLS in 2017, mm-hmm. a reason to watch is that MLS is now developed enough that a second generation of players are playing in Major League Soccer. Yep. Like Ian Harks' dad played in MLS. Mm-hmm. Now Ian Harks is going to play in MLS. Um, David Ferreira mm-hmm. uh, played for FC Dallas in MLS. His son, Jesus or Jesus Ferreira, mm-hmm. um, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Colombian-wise, um, is Jesus, I would guess, his yeah. on the roster for FC Dallas. 
Dallas mm-hmm. this year and by all accounts is a, a scary, scary uh, attacking player. Ariel Lasseter may start for the LA Galaxy yes. potentially. Roy Lasseter's son, I do believe. Nothing says a league is established mm-hmm. more than fathers and sons of different generations uh, playing in the same league. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, I feel like your first point undercut my opening about um, it's no longer teams playing in half-empty stadiums <laughs> because RFK mm-hmm. is one of the last remaining sort of uh, we don't have a soccer stadium stadiums yet but even that it's the final year at RFK well I remember even Audi when, Field 2018 I remember the last Redskins game there I think it was against the Cowboys and I think the Redskins played at RFK I oh, thought it was only a baseball stadium oh no the Redskins definitely played huh. there right up until they moved to uh, I think Jack Kent Cook is what it was at the time yeah. FedEx Field um, and then wherever they move next um, <laughs> maybe RFK whoever gives them the most money <laughs> yeah it's a distinct possibility um, but I remember I think it was the Cowboys that they blew out in that last game but I remember people had turned up that probably hadn't been there in a long time it became mm-hmm. this kind of event to go to a game yeah at, end at of an RFK. era and there's a post and on, if you want to take a piece of the stadium it'll probably be very easy to do so because it's already kind of crumbling I wish you were joking and I wish that were a joke but it's not but I can't remember if it was on Reddit you might Reddit. have to fight a raccoon for it yeah definitely <laughs> I can't remember if it was on Reddit or MLS Soccer but they had this like info of or, like this graphic of every single stadium in the league yeah like based on and it started with newest stadium to oldest stadium you scroll all the way down to the bottom and there's <laughs> RFK because I think DC are the only ones remaining in their original stadium from when they started yeah. in 1996. So here's here's something that makes that, um, like, underlines that point. Mm-hmm. In the X-Men, Days of Future Past, oh, yeah. Magneto- RF- RFK Stadium is featured in the past. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Magneto destroyed it. That yeah. didn't help the foundations at no. all. But if, if that had happened in real life, um, obviously we'd have mutants mm-hmm. and that would be uh, interesting, mm-hmm. uh, but RFK would have been demolished in the 70s and probably DC would have a much better stadium right now. They wouldn't have to wait for Audi Field. They'd already have a freshly <laughs> built stadium. For Audi Field, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> See, he was a good guy after all, yeah. Magneto. So, but I still, so I think you might still get larger crowds than you've gotten in the past, not least because DC United, I think, are going to be a better mm-hmm. team than they've been in Tickets years past. Tickets were tough to get, apparently, yeah. uh, for, this, mm-hmm. for this game. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's going to be a more exciting atmosphere uh, at DC United, at RFK, because it is the final season there. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. All right, so second reason to watch Major League Soccer in 2017. The, I'm going to call this the designated player Logan's Run effect. Okay. Do you know Logan's Run? I know of Logan's Run. Okay. <laughs> sort of like how Bart Simpson knows of Pablo Neruda. Yes. Well, no, no. He, he in that situation, conveys that he is familiar with the works <laughs> oh. of Pablo Neruda. <laughs> oh, no, isn't it like a trigonometry or long division? Someone asks him if he knows it, and he says, I know of it. <laughs> it's either that or cursive. It's one or the other. So, uh, designated player Logan's Run effect. Logan's Run is a film from the 70s mm-hmm. with Michael York. Mm-hmm. Michael York, was, if you don't know, is Basil Exposition from uh, mm-hmm. Austin Powers. Um, it's set in like a futuristic society that seems kind of utopia y, except what they do is when you hit 30, mm, you go to is. the carousel yep. and you essentially get dissolved. So, no, and Logan's Run is he decides. I think he gets his 30th birthday and thinks, no, <laughs> I'm running. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there is a Logan's Run effect with designated players in Major League Soccer because they are getting rid of all the old designated players. They're dissolving them. Yep. Sent to the carousel in the offseason were um, Steven Gerrard, Frank Lampard, Didier Drogba. Like, these guys were, what, 36, 37, 38? They mm-hmm. would all have a birthday within the MLS season. Mm-hmm. They'd, be an, like, they'd be an extra year older yep. by the end of it. Those guys are no longer around. Robbie Keane as well in there, right? Robbie Keane is mm-hmm. gone, yeah. He's going to be, we talked the other day, he's probably going to be in Saudi Arabia, maybe in England. He's mm-hmm. going to try and get a club. Oh, but I mean simply that he, he would also be one of those older DPs. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so the only like old DPs left are um, Kaká, who's only 34 and actually entered the league when he was, what, like 32 mm-hmm. and is performing for Orlando. Even if Orlando aren't performing, he's racking up goals and assists. And Andrew Perlo. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rules of humanity that apply to everybody else do not apply to Andrew Perlo. This is very true. He's a very special case. But um, across the rest of the league, it's younger designated players. We mm-hmm. talked about what Atlanta did, all those uh, DPs in their like early 20s. So the days of, basically what I'm saying is the the, uh, retirement league thing, Mm -hmm. that used to be a reason to not watch Major League Soccer. That is no longer a reason you can use. Mm -hmm. It's gone. It's done with. And I think that's an intentional move by the league and by the individual clubs. And I think there's a number of reasons for that, not least of which is the fact that you now have China shelling out more money than any MLS club is going to be able to spend to get those players that maybe otherwise might be looking towards Uh Major League Soccer. Yep, I agree. So I think if you look at that, 
you don't want to be the the club or the league that is consistently losing players or losing out on players to other leagues mm-hmm. because that becomes a PR disaster. If you are always trying to bid for this player, oh, he signed for China. Oh, yep. gonna bid, oh he signed for China. And then you keep getting like that kind of loss. I think it makes sense to change your business strategy a little bit and think, let's get younger. Let's be the league that identifies really exciting young players. Mm-hmm. And maybe those players get called up by Argentina or get called up by Colombia. Or that happened, with, Rica, Castillo. Or whom, that happened yeah. with Castillo. Yeah, or, yeah. or whomever else. And then all of a sudden, it, you go from the league that spends way too much money on players who are over the hill yep. to the league that you can look to to develop exciting players who you can then buy for the cheap. Yep, and also I think it improves the standard of play because I think it's pretty obvious that teams are better when they don't have some sort of aging superstar that they paid way too much money to who is underperforming, mm-hmm. right? And it's just a disappointment when you tune in to watch someone and they're too old and the other players around them look maybe better. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's definitely part of it, but I think it's also like anytime you spend a lot of money on a player – that's going to come with this idea that, oh, you've spent a bunch of money on me, so you're kind of building your team around me. Yep. I think old or, old or young, that's not going to matter. Mm-hmm. The difference, though, I think is that, say it's David Beckham in the very beginning, it, there, come, there comes this idea that, like, okay, we've got to build the entire team around him. Everyone knows you're doing that. The fans have shown up to see him. So if he has a bad game or if he has a bad week or, or month he's injured. or if he's injured. If people have brought tickets to see mm-hmm. – some people only went to see David Beckham. Mm-hmm. If he wasn't there – that those people are very, very disappointed with yeah. their first Major League Soccer experience. But it also becomes that much more public when it's not working, is what I mm-hmm. mean. That, like, on the Iran at Atlanta, could be very, very good, could be bad. I think it'll be good. But <laughs> what I'm saying is that, like, no one is, I feel like few people at least, are showing up being like, where is he, where is he, I gotta see him. Yeah. And then if it's not working, it's like, wait, this isn't working, this is a problem. Oh, no, like, they've built their whole team around. Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't have that weight as it does when it's this internationally known player. When we also talk in off-air mm-hmm. that um, the, the thing goes, of MLS teams not signing designated players that are big names to draw people in mm-hmm. is actually a sign that people are excited about soccer anyway mm-hmm. and that maybe the league and teams have figured out that it's not it's not needed. You right. don't need to spend big money just on a big name so you can have a face on your poster that's draped over your stadium. Yeah. People will come to watch because you're playing good soccer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that's a very exciting element of the modern MLS uh era, I guess? You might even say it's a reason to watch the league in 2017. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you for number three then, Taylor. Sure. I'm going to keep counting and see if we hit 10 or above. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to stay team specific and I'm going to go with Portland. And I'm excited to watch Portland because, I'm taking this on a personal note. Okay. I'm excited to watch Portland because again, everything I've read uh, from your preview, from reading other previews, listening to other previews, is that they're incredibly exciting. They've got young, exciting players in there. They've got Darlington to Nagby out wide yep. and he's doing big things. Sebastian Blanco will have mm-hmm. the most tackles in the league for any winger who's got who's the defensive midfielder that they've brought in who's everybody's uh, very excited yeah yep. uh and so and then you know the other names in there valeria and chara and you've mm-hmm. got adi smash up top <laughs> but by the same token there's lots of question marks around that defense and people yep. don't seem too confident and so i've heard a number of jokes about like i'm really excited to see uh like portland win four to three or three to two and so i think i'm excited to just watch portland because i think that team is going to be crazy in the best sense of the word yep. uh caleb porter might disagree. He might mm-hmm. say that their defending starts from the front with yep. the high pressure, mm-hmm. but I'm inclined to agree with you that it could be exciting times to watch Portland. Yeah, those. I think so. Not just for the TIFOs and such. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- those will obviously be there. The rivalry with yep. Seattle, the reigning champions, yep. that will definitely be there. More on Seattle in just a second, at least for me. All right, this brings me to my second point, mm-hmm. unless you have anything else to say about the Portland Timbers. I do not. Um, the One of the reasons to watch MLS in 2017 is I feel like more than any other league in the whole world, mm-hmm. you have really talented playmakers versus not quite as talented defenders. Mm -hmm. You with me? Yeah. So I'm not saying that MLS defenders are bad. Not saying they're bad. Uh, But I am arguing that the level of like attacking midfielder, Mm -hmm. like a Diego Valeri, Sebastian Blanco, uh, Darlington Nagby, up against the the average level of Major League Soccer defender, Mm -hmm. the attackers have the upper hand. Okay. So that means that you get to see attackers like, say, Sebastian Giovinco, you get to see the very best Mm -hmm. of the exciting, creative players. Because when Giovinco played in Italy... He occasionally just got smashed out of a game. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's what <laughs> happened when you are the atomic ant, yeah. When you play for Toronto mm-hmm. and the defenses aren't quite as good, you get to really show what you're all about. That, to me, makes a league really exciting. If you want to see some you know, incredible goals, incredible moments, mm-hmm. incredible um, nutmegs and skills and weird turns. Remember, Giovinco's done things in the past that we've just watched three or four times. Mm-hmm. We don't understand the physics of what just happened. Like, that's a joy to watch that yeah. stuff. And I would say only in MLS is that possible. I think, and I said yesterday, to, to and I said yesterday in previewing RSL and uh, Albert Rusnak, the Slovakian who's coming from the Eredivisie, that there is a kind of historical record of players 
players coming from the Dutch league succeeding in Major League Soccer, Mm -hmm. and the reputation of the Dutch league is really exciting attacking play. There's a attacking innovation, there's young attackers, yeah. maybe not so great defensively, and that's why <laughs> statistics can be a little bit overblown. I think there's a reason why that corresponds with Major League Soccer. Again, not that defenders are bad or defenses are weak here. It's just that a lot, I think, of emphasis gets placed on the attacking systems. Yep. And so you do have those instances in which it is, like with Portland, where they're sort of like, they've got all their attacking pieces in place, and then, well, we'll fill this guy in at center back. Or we're like, we'll make this trade for our like third string center yeah, mid to get a third the, string center back from somebody else it's to start. It's a question who partners Ridgewell, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But no one's like worrying about like wh- who's going to be the attacking playmaker. Exactly. No, it's Valeri. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think there's also, um, I think the salary cap um, plays into this. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you have the salary cap, you can only spend so much money. I'll, I have I wish I'd looked to guarantee this, but I'll, I'll will guarantee that the rosters are, the salaries are top heavy with the forwards. Mm-hmm. Right? How many designated players play centre back? I know Liam Ridgewell actually is a designated mm-hmm. player, play centre back, but not that many. Yo Van Dam is the only other one that comes yeah, to mind. Yeah, good one, yeah. But you mostly spend your money on your big name attackers. Mm-hmm. Fair? Which makes Alexi Lalas very happy. <laughs> I believe <laughs> yeah, that's what he true. argues consistently. Well, yeah. um, well, he would make the argument that goal scorers are the most valuable thing you can have, mm-hmm. and therefore they're worth spending the money on. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I'm just saying it, it, looks, good. it, it looks good for MLS. You betrayed your centre back roots. Um, Speaking of my setback mm-hmm. roots, we got um, a response. We, we asked for the portmanteau yep. for uh, Matt Hedges and Walker Zimmerman mm-hmm. at FC Dallas. Sorry, Walker Zimmerman, yes. Sorry, mm-hmm. I thought maybe Preston Zimmerman. That's a different guy. <laughs> Walker Zimmerman mm-hmm. FC Dallas. The most popular portmanteau that we didn't suggest, everybody suggested on Twitter, mm-hmm. Hedgerman. Yep. Hedgerman. <laughs> Hedgerman, which, yeah. Which also means, like, you know, the dominant force. Yeah, I, mean, I think that I forget what that is when it's spelled differently, but pronounced the same. Is that a homonym or a homophone? Either way, it's that. Someone will tell you on Twitter. I'm sure they will. <laughs> Speaking of things that someone will tell us on Twitter, um, someone did remind me that I have a tendency to, I think, conflate what Seattle did last season with what Portland did the season before, <laughs> which is I always have this idea that like Seattle did, they were like the last seed in the West, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I have the same idea that Portland did the same thing. In reality, Portland, when they made the playoffs that season, they were in third, I believe. So... Third place for Portland. My bad, Portland fans. I apologize. <laughs> That's funny. They got MLS Cup. They're fine. Yeah, okay. Well, then I am going <laughs> to, speaking of MLS Cup, I'm going to stay in Cascadia. Yeah. And I'm going to say another reason to watch is to see how Jordan Morris develops this year. Oh, okay. Because I had the idea um, that Jordan Morris was going to be factoring more out wide for Seattle than mm-hmm. he would up top. It sounds like it's going to be some combination of the two. There's a decent chance he starts up top by himself for Seattle this weekend or an opening weekend. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious to see how he progresses from playing out wide and being that kind of like pacey transition player into being a target hold up forward for Seattle. Yeah. What that does to his game overall, if he learns like how to hold up the ball, if he learns how to play with both feet, if he does like different things, or if it's more about kind of continuing to steer into what comes most naturally to him and what yep. he does best. Now, I know that's not to say that he didn't develop at all in his rookie season. You don't win rookie of the year. Did from the beginning to the end. Yeah. yeah. You don't win rookie of the year without developing, Mm-mm. obviously. But what I'm saying is, do you like completely change your skill set? Skill set, excuse me, because playing out wide, being a pacey winger, is very different than being that like lone striker and yeah. the responsibilities that come with both. And ideally, you you figure out how to do both, mm-hmm. and then you can be a dangerous piece in any situation, yeah. right? And yeah. then that ultimately benefits the U.S. national team as well. If Jordan Morris can do some on the wing and some up top, and you know you can plug him in anywhere, and mm-hmm. then you just figure out where's more dangerous. But I'm with you on that. I'm, I'm with you on the idea that... Uh, we talked about Jordan Morris for a long time mm-hmm. because he was a U.S. national team player before he was a, a major league soccer player, mm-hmm. right? So we have seen him slowly, slowly develop. Not mm-hmm. even, no, we've seen him very quickly, quickly mm-hmm. develop. Yep. Um, he develops as fast as he runs. So if that was what he did in year one mm-hmm. in major league soccer, I'm excited to see what he does in year two. I'm excited to see what he does in year two, especially if it is him up top with Ladero and Dempsey behind. Oh. Think about that. Like Think about the balls that will come in. Think about like the number of players that will be sucked in by yeah. those two playing the ball back and forth and all yeah. of a sudden Jordan Morris has those opportunities oh and by the way Ladero is like one of my prime examples of the mm-hmm. non-retiring playmaker mm-hmm. that comes into Major League Soccer and that's the level of player that you get to watch instead of you know um, Frank Lampard or mm-hmm. Steven Gerrard in their, in their twilight years indeed <laughs> full stamp agree moving on <laughs> okay uh, based on what you just said mm-hmm. uh, watching Jordan Morris develop um, I have this idea that one of the reasons to watch MLS in 2017 is going to be so so many U.S. men's national team yep. players in there um, that if you're a serious U.S. men's national team fan, you can't not watch Major League Soccer in 2017. Okay. So think about this. It's not just that like Michael Bradley, Josie Altador, Clint Dempsey, all the sort of mm. big name U.S. national team players, the core of the team, are here in Major League Soccer now because of the big DP contracts. Mm. It's also the up-and-comers who are sort of 
on the fringes of the starting eleven, like Jordan Morris, the uh, up and comers who are pushing towards being in the match day squad, like mm-hmm. Kellen Acosta, uh, like Jermaine Jones is here. Like mo- you could easily get a very, very, very strong US men's national team just based on major league soccer players, right? Mm-hmm. But you couldn't form a team of just overseas players very successfully at this point. I don't think it would be tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you still, I think you could still probably do it, but like yeah. it's not as automatic as it once was. In exactly, years past. Yeah. And, and so th- because of like the because uh, the, of the up and coming young players who mm-hmm. will be included I think um, if you really want to call yourself a US national team fan you can't have strong opinions about like who should play midfield mm-hmm. for the who should start in midfield for the US national team I don't think you can have a strong opinion unless you've watched at least some major league soccer and sort of seen who's doing what in major league soccer right because okay. then you won't know about Dax McCarty mm-hmm. you won't know about Sasha Cleston you won't know what sort of form Michael Bradley is in you won't know if Jermaine Jones is sort of uh, run out of gas or if he's like firing on all cylinders and running all over the place mm-hmm. you won't have heard of Sebastian Legette you know what I'm saying so yeah. it just seems like all of the US national team um, knowledge you can get comes from Major League Soccer, almost mm-hmm. all. Okay, I like right. that. I'm going to piggyback off of that with another one of mine, okay, then. which is um, not just like that young US national team like talent, but I'm going to say like middle young, <laughs> like still young, yeah. but talent that like has been playing abroad, but that we haven't seen. So names that come to mind for me would be Josh Gatt, would be Miguel Ibarra, Cody Cropper, who's oh, going to more yeah. on him later in the scouting report, but okay. he's probably going to be the starter for New England. Jonathan Spector coming back, even like Zach Steffen, who we've seen at times, but we don't know much With about. The 20s, yeah. yeah, but if these guys, if they're playing in Europe or if they go to Europe, there's no guarantee that they're going to play, but there's also no guarantee that you can watch them. I mean, we joked yesterday about how Josh Gatt was like a myth for a period of time because right. we never could see footage of him. Yeah. And so it does seem like MLS increasingly is kind of drawing people back in that would otherwise be in leagues that we wouldn't be able to see. We wouldn't be able to see these guys develop and how they play and what yep. they could contribute. Now there's a chance to be more familiar with them and what they could bring into the national team. Yes, agreed. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, would you agree with me as well that uh, there are people who only watch the Premier League because it's mm-hmm. the best and maybe some Bundesliga and Champions mm-hmm. League, but then they have a very strong opinion about what's happening with the starting 11 of the U.S. national team? Yes, but I think that it's not... Yes, I would agree with that, but I think a lot of that is because those individuals tend to not think that Major League Soccer offers that much for the U.S. National Right, team. and I'm saying that it does, mm-hmm. and you should watch it okay. in 2017. All right. All right. Uh, next one. <laughs> next thing there's I've a, got... There's a chance you're in an echo chamber here, but sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, next thing I've got is the great thing about Major League Soccer in general, mm-hmm. and again in MLS 2017, is... You can nerd out on the weird rules. Okay. <laughs> so you've got nowhere else has this, right? Mm-hmm. You've got your designated players, you've got your homegrown players, your generation Adidas, you've got the uh, allocation order, you've got the draft order, general allocation money, targeted allocation money, and probably some rules I don't know about. Mm-hmm. There is no other league on earth where it is. There's such a level of bureaucracy. And I think this is like a glass half full, glass half empty kind mm-hmm. of thing. You can complain about that and just say, I don't understand any of that, I refuse to watch it. Or you can be like, okay, I'm going to read up on this. Because the rules and regulations are on the MLS soccer site, Mm -hmm. if you dig deep enough, right? You can figure out what they mean, and then you can sort of take it as another layer of entertainment about the league, watching teams try to navigate this this crazy labyrinth of rules. Yeah, I think I agree with you most of the way okay. um, and it actually goes into my final one but I think I agree with you in the idea that like it's a very structured league with, with specific rules that govern how uh, teams can operate and I think yeah. it's great in ter- that that leads to parity so there's always excitement going into the season I like that they have moved away from certain like it was necessary but there were certain situations that I think were more laughable and laughing stock-esque yeah, than yeah. they were, like, interesting. But even, oh, okay, I was going to say even those are interesting, but... You, see, you I don't think so, because, because what I was going to go with my fifth one was, I want to see if the East can stop being dominated by the West. And we can talk about, like, the conferences in a second. Yeah. But what I wanted to point to was uh, that, don't forget that there were times when the way, because of the number of teams in the league, that there were times when, like, the Western conference teams would be playing in the East in the playoffs, because that yeah, was yeah. how, like, the playoff format had to work it imbalance, and yeah. it just ended up being like wait what is happening why are San Jose yeah. suddenly in the east this is stupid okay but that's not happening anymore right? no it's not yeah. but that's what I mean is that we've moved away from some of that I see. forced weirdness uh-huh. into necessary weirdness yep. that makes the league interesting as opposed to <laughs> makes the league sort of look stupid because uh, yeah because I want to say you're right it's the only other league it's mm-hmm. the only league sorry there's no other league where you can like See that a team has, or hear that a team has traded some general allocation money 
to a couple of different teams mm-hmm. to move up the allocation order. Mm-hmm. And then you know that a, a transfer is coming. You know there's a decent-sized name coming into that team, yeah. but you don't know who it is. But it's it's like a very, like... Uh, MLS version of transfer rumors, right? Yeah. When you see the moves, the front office moves. What was the one yesterday when, like, a team oh, announced the I signing sh- of Gam and Tam? I think it was Houston um, sent seventy five thousand in general allocation mm-hmm. money to Vancouver in exchange for something. Yeah, and it, it was an international it's a spot. spot. Yeah, um, and Vancouver brilliantly tweeted out, "Welcome general allocation money," <laughs> and had like the yep. welcome card as mm-hmm. if it was a player. Yeah. yeah, so at least even the teams have a sense of humor about the crazy bureaucracy. Yes. and you can enjoy it instead of just complaining about it. All right, okay, right. I'll give you that. <laughs> But I want to go – so to go back to my final one, which yes, is yes. the East being dominated by the West, um, I heard this uh, this morning on Extra Time Radio's Western Conference Preview, which is very good. You should check that out too. Is it better than ours? Uh, well, you know, I mean, there's a shorter. There's a shorter because they do like the time constraints. <laughs> if there's one thing I'll say about great us answer. that I'll we do – I'll put you on the spot and it's a great answer. Well, I'll, I'll say this. If there's one thing I'll say about our show, we don't have time constraints. <laughs> we can talk. <laughs> um, but they were pointing out that since 2004, only three teams from the East have won MLS Cup. One of those teams is now in the Western Conference. That's Sporting KC. Wow. Yes. So it's DC in 2004, it's Columbus in 2008, and it's Sporting KC in 2013. And again, they're now in the West. Wow, so wow, two wow. Eastern Conference teams have won since 2004. <laughs> so, and I think that's because generally, like, it's the a lot West, of LA Galaxy. The West had, yeah, it's been LA Galaxy. You've kind of had those, those super teams, and then even Seattle when they started getting those big name mm-hmm. players coming in. Now I think it's a little more balanced. I think the East has a lot of talent. I'd say Toronto is one of the favorites to win this year. You've always got NYCFC. You've got the New York Red Bulls in there. I say DC are in with a shout. So uh-huh. there's lots so of different Eastern Conference teams. Your reason to watch is to see if like the us East Coast people can. Uh, is this like a Woody Allen thing where you like you don't want to <laughs> you yeah. don't want to go on? The, you, if you're a person, East who's Coast like, baby, he's like so pro East Coast <laughs> that he just has a temper tantrum when he goes to the West Coast. Yeah, pretty much. You just want to support the Eastern Conference. Maybe there's a chance that it flips this year. Yeah, I think so. But I think it's also because I think like. You're definitely going to have bad teams. There's always bad teams. There's always teams who finish last. Mm-hmm. That's the way numbers work. But I'm excited to see what I think will be a better league from top to bottom, which means it won't be quite so like the West. Well, their worst team is still on like 29 points or something like that. And then the yeah. East, their worst team is on 13 points, right. which is an oversimplification. And it's like it's never been that bad. It's never been that drastic. Yeah. But there have definitely been those times when you could see based on the columns, wins and losses and points, that one conference was clearly better than the other one. Yep. And then MLS Cup has, at least in the last like 13 years, reflected that. Before we move on, I want mm-hmm. to put um, an Annie Hall image in your head. Right. Um, it's Michael Bradley in a car. Trying to uh, trying to get into reverse mm-hmm. and having a temper tantrum. <laughs> Michael Bradley has arrested. no temper tantrums. He just stays calm. <laughs> I was just suppose. thinking of a very East Coast soccer player. Like isn't he like uh, from New Jersey? So. Was with Metro Stars for a bit. Now plays yeah. for Toronto. So he's super yeah, East yeah. Coast, right? He's hanging out on the East Coast. He's only gone. <laughs> he's not going to Paul Simon's parties. Yeah, no. Say. He didn't go west. He went east. Yeah, <laughs> it fits. If you've seen any Hall, these are great jokes. If you've not, then I'm just talking nonsense, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which category do you fall into? Uh, I see. I've seen any Hall. It's been a while. <laughs> Well, these are just not great jokes. Yeah, you know. <laughs> All right. One of the next things I want to talk about is the commitment to youth that is happening in Major League Soccer. Um, this, like, we talked about the, the weird bureaucracy stuff before. That can be used for good. And MLS is one of the few, again, one of the few leagues on earth mm-hmm. that prioritizes youth in a way that nowhere else does with the homegrown player rule. Mm-hmm. So what the homegrown player rule does, for those who don't know, um, you can sign homegrown players like Jordan Morris. You can pay them a certain amount of money that can be kind of generous at this point, um, and they don't count against your salary cap. That is an incentive to get good young players mm-hmm. on your roster, and that's why we do have now. It's, it's really maturing, right? There are I counted earlier. I, I pasted into an Excel document mm-hmm. to count. There are 81 homegrown players in MLS in 2017, and lots of them are worth watching. There's a Mm -hmm. whole new generation coming through. Yeah. I mean, and it seems to be like uh, consistently teams, rather than looking to go abroad and sign an aging veteran to come in to kind of fill out the ranks, fill out that roster, are Mm -hmm. now looking to their own development systems, their own academies. And with that, you have young, exciting players coming through. And again, you don't have those huge big money transfers as a result. Yeah, so for example, right, we mentioned Jordan Morris, mm-hmm. we mentioned Kellen Acosta, right, guys that we are already excited about. Will Trapp is a homegrown player, right? Those guys got a chance because of the homegrown player rule. Mm-hmm. But then you've got this new generation coming through, exemplified by someone like Andrew Carlton, right, who's only 16 mm-hmm. and is super exciting. Uh, we talked yesterday on the preview, sorry, a couple of days ago on the preview, 
um, about FC Dallas and how they've got um, Javier Morales replacing Mauro Diaz for the, the start of the season mm-hmm. where Diaz is injured. They've also got Paxton Pomical, right. um, Total Soccer Show Scouting Network uh, player. Apparently, he's been so good in preseason. There's a good chance he gets serious minutes in M- serious mm-hmm. meaning some minutes yeah. <laughs> in MLS this season. I think he's only 16 or 17. Mm-hmm. And you've got Jesus Ferreira as well. Mm-hmm. So it's a league where you really can see youth get a chance yeah. compared to the Premier League. Where, do you remember the stat from earlier on? Where there was only like Marcus Mar- Rashford Mar- was, the Rashford only, was the only one. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that's terrifying. Mm-hmm. If you're I think, a and to finish that stat, it was what? He's the only like teenager in the top five leagues who'd gotten more than five starts, I yes. think it was that season. Right, yeah. that doesn't happen in Major League Soccer. No, so and, and even he is complaining about lack of playing time. Right? So it, it's definitely not like it's all rosy in the Premier League, yeah. for sure. All and right. I think we have to legally mention Alfonso Davies as well, by the way. Of course we do. As long of as we're talking we about do. young Thank teenagers you. who and make me feel like I haven't done enough of my life. And I'm excited, I'm excited to go see him this year yeah. as well. No, I'm like, not going to go to Vancouver. I'm excited to <laughs> see him on TV. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, you got any more for me, Taylor? Uh, I do not, but we have a lot from Twitter. Okay, I've got some more for you. How about that? Okay. okay. So um, we're not sticking to the 10 then? I guess not. <laughs> we just hit 10. I guess I've got two more. Sure. Is that okay? Uh, you'll, you'll indulge me? Mm-hmm. How about this idea? If you are a tactics nerd, mm-hmm. and I would include us in this, it's mm-hmm. not an insult, we can say it, um, which I feel like a lot of American soccer fandom is all about being uh, a tactics nerd. Um, MLS and the coverage it gets on MLSsoccer.com is one of the best leagues you can follow in terms of being exposed to tactics and being able to see various tactical styles. Okay. Um, and the stuff I'm thinking about is like uh, you got these uh, these like high pressure teams, right? You got mm-hmm. like New York Red Bulls, uh, Timbers do it, Sporting KC do it, and you've got different styles of pressure like FC Dallas, maybe a little sit off a little bit. And there aren't many teams that just. Uh, sit back and defend and just hope for a nil-nil or at best to not lose too heavily like mm-hmm. when, say, Real Madrid play <laughs> yeah. play a much a much smaller team. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think that's part of it is that because you have the salary cap, because everyone's kind of operating from the same basis, yeah. you can't then have a Real Madrid who have 8 million players who are worth $8 million or right. way more money. Well, <laughs> Maybe it's 8 players who are worth $80 million. That well, probably fits better. Cristiano Ronaldo was worth <laughs> around that, right? When they saw, I can't remember the... Yeah. Gareth Bale, uh, sorry, Gareth yeah. Bale was, uh, went for around mm-hmm. that much. Yeah. But either way, I mean, basically that means that you can't have those gigantic clubs. So you are all kind of starting from the same level. So then you have to have different ways to get around those limitations. Uh And a lot of that results in tactical experimentation. Yeah. I'm even thinking of uh, Jason Christ when he's in charge at Rail Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. The team is the star. Yeah. Kind of what that really means Mm -hmm. is tactics is the star. Yeah. The tactics are the star. Either way. George Christ is going to be mad about Mm -hmm. (laughs) mad about all that. And then the other element of this is I really think MLSsoccer.com, Matt Doyle and some other writing on there, um, they do a great job of explaining tactics to you. Yeah, agree. So Mm -hmm. you can get really good tactical breakdown of what happens in Major League Soccer games. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because maybe um, the New York Times doesn't do a tactical breakdown for New York Red Bulls or Mm -hmm. NYCFC. But at the same time, like the Guardian, uh, actually the Guardian is maybe a bad example, but a lot of English newspapers don't give you a tactical breakdown of a game, but there's no sort of um, separate operation that will then do tactics for you mm-hmm. like MLS Soccer does for MLS games. Yeah. I, also, I do also think, though, that part of that is that with, for example, the Premier League, there's so much scrutiny and so much criticism from the press that mm-hmm. managers don't necessarily want to talk to the press. Yes. I think with Major League Soccer... Yeah, the tactics are like a big secret, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so you, or you'll get a lot of like, no, that's not what we were doing, or like they just or they don't want to answer yeah. the question. See Guardiola's face this year. Yeah. And so with Major League Soccer, I think you get... You, you definitely have scrutiny, but you don't have that like rapid criticism, like like cauldron of anger mm-hmm. that surrounds the team so that I think coaches can be a little bit more open about what they're trying to do. Yeah. We've seen that at half like at halftime talks when like yeah, Greg Vanny will say like, oh this isn't working, so we're gonna do this. It's like, yeah. oh he just told us his plan for the second oh, half. Oh no there was the, in the MLS Cup final they mm-hmm. mic'd him up for a bit, right? Yeah. So you could hear what he was asking exactly. players to do. Yeah. yeah. And so so I think with that Mourinho's you, not letting that happen. Nope. And so I think <laughs> you get more of an understanding of what the team is trying to do for that reason than I think the journalists covering the teams get more of an understanding of what the team is doing as a result so right. you get better coverage and better explanation of the tactics. Yeah, and then and then in a way, if you don't know much about tactics, you mm-hmm. can learn throughout the season because you can see the inner workings of a lot of what's going on yeah. with these teams. Yep. All right, there's. right? I've got one final reason to watch MLS in 2017. What's um, I want to suggest that MLS is the most progressive male sports league in America and maybe the most progressive soccer league in the world. Okay. Yeah? I think I would agree with that, yeah. Right, you want me to maybe make the case? Sure. All right, so the first um, openly gay male athlete mm-hmm. in American sports, 
Robbie Rogers for the LA Galaxy in Major League Soccer in 2013. He made history. An active athlete, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So when he set foot on the field in mm-hmm. 2013 for LA Galaxy, he was making history right. in the United States. Right. Um, Orlando's stadium um, is opening this year. Mm-hmm. They have the 49 uh, seats yep. uh, with the rainbow flag mm-hmm. uh, to commemorate the victims of the tragedy in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also, you know, there's, it's, it's a gay pride symbol. Yep. It's going to be in that stadium forever, mm-hmm. right? The right. colors might fade. They can repaint them and brighten yep. them up again. This is true. That, that'll be there forever it's the only league I can think of that has fined players for using gay slurs right Right. Mm-hmm. I think it was Alan Gordon and Colin Clark without yeah. an E on the end not the Colin Clark who was yeah. at the yeah. uh, kickers got they fined or they were suspended maybe mm-hmm. both for using uh, for using gay slurs mm-hmm. um, I think you have Pride Night at a couple different I mean, maybe six yeah. different clubs yeah okay yeah yeah. I remember, I remember that mm-hmm. happening yeah and I'm assuming again in 2017 yeah. um, and I'm not saying other leagues don't have initiatives like this mm-hmm. and I'm not saying MLS is perfect the fact that they had to fine Mm-hmm. And suspend Alan Gordon and Colin Clark means mm-hmm. that you know things are not 100 percent perfect, mm-hmm. and you, you could argue that the league could do more. But I really think Major League Soccer is doing more than anyone else. Yeah, I think so, and I think that if you look at like the fan culture as a whole as well, yeah, it tends to be. I think like if you look at the tifos and things like that, it tends to be much more creative than just like we hate you or whatever. <laughs> like you don't get that. You get like uh, yeah. Dorothy walking the yellow brick road or uh, <laughs> you know any number of different tifos. Uh, we could go on and on and on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, except not ones about Jovan Jones, which kind of blows <laughs> me out. But so I think you get maybe more this of, season. Like, maybe that this season. creative expression and that sort of like. As strange as it sounds, because generally they're about opposition, but it's much more, I feel like, inclusive than maybe it is in other uh, leagues around the world. Yeah, or either in other American sports, right, mm-hmm. which are a lot more mainstream and maybe there's more commercial dollars at stake. And yep. so everyone's a bit more cautious about what they do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. But I do think you get those stories a lot. I mean, I know there have been more, ones more recently, but like the Richie Incognito with Miami Dolphins, where there was like bullying and harassment and it was just a very like toxic atmosphere. And you get that sort of coverage. Mm-hmm. I don't think you get nearly... And not just because MLS isn't as covered as, say, those leagues, but just because I think it doesn't happen with near the frequency as it does in, say, the NFL or other major leagues around the world. And speaking of other leagues around the world, there was the mm-hmm. stuff in Serbia recently. Yep. Um, Everton Luiz was uh, essentially racially abused by SK Rad fans. Everton Luiz plays for partners in Belgrade to the point that he was in tears. Mm-hmm. Right? It'd be really hard to imagine that happening in Major League Soccer. Mm-hmm. And again, not that there aren't, not that uh, the Major League Soccer is free of any racial bias at all. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, um, MLSsoccer.com had the uh, Black History Month uh, right. roundtable, mm-hmm. right? Hosted by Kevin Brown with Josie Altador, Lynn Williams, and I think two journalists, um, the FC Harlem owner. Uh, I'd recommend going to watch it. Actually, it's a really interesting, like, 40 minute conversation on race in soccer. All right. Right. Um, okay, should we move on to listener suggestions sure. for reasons to watch MLS in 2017? Yeah, so uh, like we were talking about, Nick Caters felt the same. He said it's wide open. Parody is not a curse word. It's a blessing. Yes. I still, I mean, we also, also talk about how we would like to see a super club yeah. sometime, but okay, we, I can take that as a reason <laughs> to watch. Um, the boss at Robert W. Cross um, mm-hmm. says, it's your domestic league and being a Euro stub is not fashionable post-Brexit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Ross Johnson says soccer is better than football. I, I think, assume he means mm, throwball. I would assume so. I think many people <laughs> might disagree with that, but sure. <laughs> um, Oscar Villalobos says it is not a two-team league competition like Spain, Germany, or France. Mm-hmm. Oscar's words, not mine. But that, that does mean like it's really hard to predict um, who's going to win, right? Who's mm-hmm. going to win MLS Cup is really hard to predict at the start of the season. Uh, GEE, which is at Tavo underscore 31. I think this is a good one, so we get to the full username. <laughs> or she is the full username, excuse me. Uh, more views equals more money for the league, equals better players, equals kids look up to better players, equals USMNT gets better, <laughs> equals US wins the World Cup. Right. Well if said, you, Guy. If you want the US to win the World Cup yep. in the future, watch Major League Soccer now because you putting your eyes on the league means they can charge more to advertisers, they can get more money, you improve soccer in America. That's a great argument. Mm-hmm. I'm into that one. All right. Uh, JC Zambrano says, MLS had 22 players in the 2014 World Cup. Good chance that number will grow for the 2018 World Cup. Good opportunity to learn about players now. Because mm-hmm, we were surprised even this summer that there were MLS players playing in the Euros. And I think yes. that as time goes on, as the league gets more competitive and expands to uh, a number of new cities, you're going to have more players. I think you're going to have – that will be less of an outlier that you have players playing in the Euros yeah. in the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Oh, next. And, oh, sorry, guys. I was going to say, and you mentioned uh, 22 players. It's also 22 clubs, which, as Michael uh, Parasol points out, that means the it is now 10% bigger than the Premier League. Major League <laughs> Soccer. I'm not sure that's necessarily a reason to watch. Nope, I think it is. But it has 10% more teams on the Premier League. Yep, it means it's 10% better. <laughs> Here's a great one from Gregory Michael. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gregory says, VAR is the new kid on the block. 
That's in MLS in 2017, right? So mm-hmm. as I understand it, VAR, Video Assistant Referee, not review, um, is where uh, they can be like, uh, oh, I keep wanting to say fourth official because I use that just as a term for any referee that you can't see straight away. And mm-hmm. um, there's somebody with video review technology who can communicate with the referee. Right. So decisions can get made on video review. Right. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Taylor, my understanding is that this will be trialed in the first half of the season, like not actually used by the center mm-hmm. ref, but the video people will be like practicing. Yep. And then I think come the all-star game and then the second half of the season, you will actually have video assistant referee being being used in Major League Soccer, which should make it the first uh, top tier league in the world that is using it. There we are. I said top All tier because right. USL use it. Last and you, year. yeah, and you missed the uh, you missed the tagline for this because Gregory Michael wrote it out in such a way that you could read it as like the promo for. Like, uh, you know, if you're if you're leading into the soccer coverage, yeah. VR is the new kid on the block. Will coaches and players praise or despise it? Find out this season on MLS 2017. <laughs> So, yeah, those ads will start running in July. Right, yeah. <laughs> oh, here's one final one mm-hmm. from um, Alan Fraser. Um, I think he's based in Scotland. Hello, Alan. Um, Alan says, it comes on Sky Sports late on a Sunday night when there isn't anything else on, and it's better than you might think, which I'm interpreting to mean people outside of the United States mm-hmm. are now watching Major League Soccer. Sky Sports is in the UK, by the way. Um, so why aren't we watching it? Why yeah. aren't you watching it? Yeah. If, if other people are watching it, Americans should be watching it as well. I agree. <laughs> I agree with all of those things. For the most part. Before we move on to talk U.S. women's national team um, and some scouting reports, I want to let you know that today's show is brought to you by Health IQ. We've got a new sponsor, Taylor, Health IQ. Indeed. Health IQ wants to give financial rewards to health-conscious people. They have partnered with major life insurance companies to get lower rates for people with a healthy lifestyle. They've used science and data, very important, to fight for lower rates on life insurance for health-conscious folks, including soccer players, runners, cyclists, weightlifters, swimmers, vegans, vegetarians, and the like. Ooh, I'm at least two of those things. Um, Research has shown that avid soccer players have a 41% lower risk of heart disease and a 35% lower risk of early death. But many soccer players, health like you say, don't realize they can get a special rate due to their health conscious lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Health IQ have asked us to get the message out that if you play soccer, you almost certainly qualify for the special life insurance rate. Mm -hmm. So you can go to healthiq.com slash TSS. The link is in the show notes to take the quiz and get a quote. Speaking of the quiz, Tyler, mm-hmm. guess what I've done? What, what have you done here? I've only pulled it up in front of me here. So it's basically whatever your activity is, is that correct? So if you're a soccer yeah. player, they've got a quiz like that kind of tests your knowledge? Yeah, so if you go to Health IQ, you set up a profile, and then there are sort of various quizzes you can take that are about sort of healthy activities. Mm-hmm. So there's one about diet, there's yep. one about cycling, there's one about soccer. Mm-hmm. And the more, so you do these quizzes, uh, then your answers build up your like points profile, mm-hmm. and then that is what Health IQ can take that information and say, this person knows this much, they definitely do all these sports and eat this healthy way, mm-hmm. then they can take that to life insurers and say, we're going to make the case they should get a special lower rate on life insurance. Okay. okay. So speaking of, um, mm-hmm. I'm going to do this. You get a lot of time when you go to the website and do this. You can take your time and answer the questions. I'm going to do it a bit quick fire on you. I'm going to ask you some soccer questions. Okay. Okay. Um, after a soccer injury, mm-hmm. participation should blank. The injured area should be evaluated and treated properly. So participation part- should cease. Well, the, the uh, options are, it's, a multi, mm-hmm. it's a multi-choice, be stopped in a few minutes, be encouraged, resume immediately, or be stopped immediately. Be stopped immediately. Is correct. Yeah. You got it mm-hmm. right, Taylor. You ready for one more question? I don't necessarily abide by that, but yeah, sure. <laughs> but you know what should, should happen? Yep. It depends if you're through on goal or not. Yep. Right? Um, <laughs> Achilles tendonitis. You're talking to the guy who got his two front teeth knocked out and <laughs> continued to play. Don't tell the health <laughs> people. Um, Achilles tendonitis and blank yeah. are, um, are high among the list of most common overuses in soccer. Achilles tendonitis and blank are high among Ooh. the list of most common overuse injuries in soccer. The other options are... Uh-huh. You look like you have one in your head already. I, I had a thought, yeah. Shin splints, mm-hmm. Charlie horses, broken fingers, deep thigh bruises. I'm going to say shin splints. That feels right to me. It's correct. Okay. Shin splints is the correct okay. answer. So yeah, there you go. So Taylor did that under pressure. Mm-hmm. You get 20 questions. I didn't realize could... it was multiple choice. That makes me feel way better. <laughs> so these are questions are essentially to prove mm-hmm. that you play soccer. So yep. if you're a soccer player, you can then go to uh, healthiq.com slash TSS, set up a profile, and you will be able to get um, a quote that is much lower on life insurance than anywhere else. There we are. So go to healthiq.com slash TSS, take the quiz and get a quote. Thank you to Health IQ for sponsoring today's episode. So. Mm-hmm. And thank you to the U.S. Women's National Team for playing some exciting soccer the other night. It certainly was, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, we've got a quick review of U.S. Women's National Team 1, Germany 0 in the She Believes Cup. Mm-hmm. 
I'm going to make the case here. The reason this was exciting is this really was the new look US Women's National Team Mm -hmm. in a crazy formation up against one of the other best teams in the world, and they won. Right. How about that? Indeed. And so I know right before the game, you uh, you saw the tweet from Steffi Yang. I think it was the the post that was basically her predicted the lineup, where the formation would be. And then we were like, oh, that's what it's actually going to be. She had the 11 players that had been selected, and she sort of guessed at what the formation would be. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, that's that's pretty aggressive. Right. Yeah. It It was exactly that. So not only, I mean, we had Stephanie Yang as a guest on the show because she Mm -hmm. knows what she's talking about. There's more proof that Stephanie Yang knows what she's talking about. And it's proof that the U.S. women's national team is now sort of hyper attacking and aggressive and mm-hmm. exciting. Um, yeah. So, would you mind describing the lineup to people? I mean, yeah. So you basically had your like you had some changes, obviously, than like what people would expect because you still have Hope Solo gone, so you have yeah. less an iron goal. I think you had Julie Johnson on the bench. You yep. had Becky Sauerbrunn starting as like a right center back. Yep. And back three, three. Center back. I mean, back yeah. three is the big back thing. Three right? With Ali Long in the middle, yep. which is. Surprising, kind of libero-ish. Yeah, I think so. But like, it seems like the bigger thing, as you pointed out, is it's about attacking. It's about like kind of mm-hmm. aggressively getting the ball forward. And I think Ali Long is the one who's going to be able to do that. I'm guessing that's why she was the center back yeah. because she's used to being more of a ball playing midfielder. Yes, I agree. So with she that. can drop back in and handle that pressure. And then ahead of that back three, mm-hmm. it's a three, four, one, oh, and, uh, two. Short was it? Was the uh, third defender? Casey Short Casey was the short. New Yeah, she looked yeah. really sort of. I don't know what the word is, badass. Yep. You know what I mean? No one was getting faster. She could body some people. That's yeah, sure. and she had some moves as well. Like, mm-hmm. So she could buy herself a little bit of time on yep. the ball. And she was left-footed, which makes a left centre-back, mm-hmm. I, I believe she's left-footed, made it really nice and balanced, right? Because yeah. you didn't have the ball, a, a weird right-footed player going the wrong way. <laughs> Ahead of that, so you got the wing-backs, if you want to call it that, mm-hmm. to start the game with Crystal Dunn and Tobin Heath. Crystal Dunn and Tobin Heath. Don't has, think of them as defenders, yeah, um, per se. but... I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. That's two hyper-attacking players. Uh, centre midfields were Samantha Mewis and uh, Morgan Bryan. Mm-hmm. So there's a little more defensive. But then ahead of that, Carly Lloyd, Kristen Press, and Lynn Williams. Mm-hmm. So if you're putting this into a shape, roughly speaking, I'd say you could go like 3-4-1-2 or you yeah. could go 3-4-3. Three, three. I'd call it that, but it's, good. it's definitely got five attackers. Right. right. There's two outside players plus Carly Lloyd mm-hmm. plus the front two. It's got five attackers, right? Yeah. Maybe that's fine if you go up against uh, like Switzerland or Romania. You can maybe expect to win up against Germany Mm -hmm. and it worked it did mostly mostly (laughs) I would say that like it seemed like what they were trying to do the United States was when they would get the ball in defense it would go to Ali Long Ali Long it seemed like was trying to play the ball low on the ground to Morgan Bryan and I think the idea was she would play it out wide to those wingers those wingers would drive down and then you'd start that attack so like draw Germany into the middle Mm -hmm. then Morgan Bryan spreads it out and then yeah Dunn or Heath or later on Mallory Pugh Mm -hmm. could accelerate down the wing and she looked excellent when she came on in the second half Um, I would say that that game plan worked to some extent there were Mm -hmm. Times when we would see that work exactly as it was supposed to. There were times when Morgan Bryan would get the ball, be surrounded by people, and have to drop it back. Yeah. And then the U.S. would sort of pass it around, and it was clear that they then didn't quite know what they were supposed to do. Yes. I think Germany also did a very good job of exploiting the United States' eagerness to get forward and to be aggressive mm-hmm. by being aggressive themselves. Again, obviously didn't score, finished one nil, courtesy of Lynn Williams, but. I mean, I think there were some moments when we were both like, ooh, Germany looked very good. This mm-hmm. could be problematic. Oh, yeah. But I think the United States did a good job to kind of adjust, figure things out on the fly, and get the result. And so the win in the end, it comes mm-hmm. from a Lynn Williams goal, but it starts with a Kristen Press press. Mm-hmm. And that is and the other thing that the U.S. women's national team did is they really pressed Germany really high, right? right? They sent, like, Lloyd would join the front two, mm-hmm. midfielders would push up, and they would just close Germany down. I think in the end, Press chases um, after four people. Mm-hmm. Stri- I can't remember the name of the defender, but takes the ball off her, drives at the defence, hits the bar. It could have been a great goal. Yep. Um, uh, I can't remember who gets the second Toby follow-up. Heath. Toby Heath has the second follow-up, then Lynn Williams. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to say semi-luckily scores. It looks, if, if you look at it from, like, a wide angle, it looks like a really crafty finish because basically it's... It's a rebound off of a rebound, and mm-hmm. it kind of spills to her. The defender who gets stripped, number 17, I forget uh, what her name is. But she then, like, the rebound comes oh, back. She from, side foots it to... She, to she basically, Tobin Heath shoots off of the Christian Press shot. Like, it goes off the crossbar, it goes to Tobin Heath. She shoots. The German player, like, kind of blocks it with her, with her left foot, and it rolls to Lynn Williams, who then hits it back across herself into the net. But... On the wide angle, it looks like a really crafty finish because it looks like she's wrong-footed the goalkeeper. Uh-huh. I don't know if that was as intentional. She's because looking she, down the whole time. She right? doesn't look up to see where the goalkeeper is to see where she is in relation to the goal. So again, this is one of those situations where it could be that she's just that much of a like a predatory player that she knows exactly where she is and how yeah. to strike the ball. Or it could be that her goal was, let me just get this on frame and I hopefully think, something happens. I think that's what it was. Mm-hmm. And you, you can say that's not as good as like picking your spot and burying it there, mm-hmm. but they, it went in. 
So it did. Pretty- <laughs> it did. I would say this though that uh, JP Della Camera had this idea that like, well, that's all that matters. If you score a goal, then everything else is forgotten. I don't <laughs> think that that's true, and I don't think, especially with a team like the United States that has so much talent. Keep yes. in mind, this is the team that had Alex Morgan on the bench. Yep, starting on the bench in this game. I'm on the bench. Yeah. Starting on the bench. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alex Morgan did eventually come in, uh, but and Lynn Williams, I think, played the full full game. But you can't really. Or did she come out? I can't I remember. Think she came out. Oh, I can't remember. Either. Yeah. Either way. <laughs> either way. I mean, you she have, came out for Lindsay Horan. You can't have a player be. Fact. There you go. You can't have a player be like wasteful and sort of a little bit awkward at times. Just some loose passes, right? Yeah, there. and and I think I mean so overall it was a, a decent game from her, but it certainly wasn't like she scored a goal and therefore she's automatically yeah. going to start the next. She game. just disagreed. JP Della Camera. Basically. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but that's part of the excitement of this team now, right? Mm-hmm. If they are going to play this attacking style, and I'm going to argue if they did it against Germany, then they're going to do it against anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, then competition really will be about absolutely fine tuning this system Mm -hmm. and seeing who is the most effective in doing it right Mm -hmm. Um, one of the I I do want to say it wasn't 100% perfect right Right. you talked about how sometimes the passing would lead nowhere Mm -hmm. if it didn't work through Morgan Bryan sometimes the pressing wasn't as good as it needed to be in that you saw them do it but then I saw Germany play their way out of Mm -hmm. it and get behind the US and even the goal Kristen Press chases four different people Mm -hmm. before she takes the ball off someone that like is impressive it's massively impressive but it also doesn't speak to like a really organized team system if one player is responsible for chasing right. four people right and you i mean and you could see that that it was it was uncertainty about do I stay like do I prioritize shape or do I prioritize press yep. and step into the player because there were a number of situations when like Germany would drop the ball back and the player who dropped the ball would continue the run mm-hmm. and then nobody would follow her mm-hmm. because it was sort of like no I'm, I'm pressing the ball yeah. but then they would as you said bypass that press because then that player has been like remained unmarked because I think people are trying to stay in their shape yeah so I imagine that. As the U.S. gets a little more familiar with it, as it gets a little bit just kind of like comes more naturally, I think you then learn when to press, when to step, and then it's not one player having to do all the pressing. So the next test is this weekend. I think it's Saturday against England. Mm -hmm. It's USA v. England, um, which weirdly I feel more – like when it's U.S.-England men's teams, I feel – like 50-50 mm-hmm. uh, US women England women I feel more for the US women just because it's the team that I know fair weather fan better yeah basically yeah. glory hunter that's how you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm a trophy hunter <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll take a look at that game maybe uh, next week mm-hmm. um, after it's going to be on Fox on Saturday mm-hmm. we will probably not be watching live would be my guess oh because we'll be at DC versus yep. Sporting KC mm-hmm. alright um, final thing on today's show Taylor the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. I see four talented young players in front of me. You sure do. Uh, up first is Ryan Welsh scouting Hannah Siebert, the 22, 22 year old American goalkeeper. Hannah has signed for the Orlando Pride. She was called up by the U.S. Women's National Team, but then had an unsuccessful draft. I'm guessing that means she wasn't drafted. How can you be called up by the national team and then have an unsuccessful draft? I'm not entirely certain. Huh. But that's what Ryan has reported, so that's what I'm rolling with. Uh, but this is definitely positive news because she now has a club. She is now a professional soccer player. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, up next. Daniel Jones is scouting Cody Cropper, 24-year-old American goalkeeper formerly of MK Duns, Mm -hmm. now of the New England Revolution. Um, Daniel says, according to the Bent Musket, Cody was one of the big winners in New England's preseason camp. They report that, quote, he commanded his box, stood strong one-on-one and made intelligent decisions when they mattered most. As As a result, it looks likely that he will be the starting goalkeeper for the Revolution in the coming season. Mm -hmm. Does Kraft know Cody Cropper's name? No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. He's still like celebrating with the Super Bowl trophy on a yacht somewhere. Uh, up next is Alex Welsh scouting Ben Swanson, the 19-year-old midfielder for Columbus, on loan at Pittsburgh in the USL. All right. Alex says that Ben is a Crew Academy product who has been with the club since he was nine. Mm-hmm. He was loaned to Pittsburgh Riverhounds, uh, which is Columbus's USL affiliate, but missed most of last season with a shoulder injury. He did make his MLS debut last year, however, uh, which he did in the same week as he graduated from high school. <laughs> so it was a momentous week, I'm guessing. Uh, this season, he has once again been loaned to the Riverhounds, and Crew coach Greg Burhalter has said he wants to see Swanson establish himself as a key component in that squad. I'd like to see him do that all season long, except, except for the yeah. one game where we see him play against the Richmond Kickers. Yes. <laughs> we'll well, be home, on, home and away. So, yeah. Those two yeah, games. Two games yeah. yeah, We'll be on commentary duty for <laughs> that game. Final scouting report is from Alex Brew scouting Davy Selkie, the 22-year-old German striker for Rassenball Sport Leipzig. Um, Alex says, Selkie came off the bench in the 84th minute in RB Leipzig's 3-1 win over FC Köln last Saturday. In his limited appearance, he committed two fouls and was caught offside once. So not the best set of stats on 
the Bucks score. <laughs> he only has two starts this season so far and 13 substitute appearances. The main reason for his lack of time and production is the prolific pairing of Timo Werner and Emil Forsberg, who have 20 goals and 19 assists between them. I believe that's Forsberg. <laughs> the UEFA pronunciation guide says so. I disagree, as do Swedish people. Um, however, the likelihood of a bigger club buying Forsberg or Werner is high <laughs> as a potential mo- loan move, as is a potential loan move mm-hmm. next season. So Alex is hoping that Selke's play improves and his limited remaining chances this season to set him up for a bigger 2017-18 campaign. Mm-hmm. Thank you to everyone who wrote in, submitted those scouting reports. We very much appreciate it. We very much appreciate knowing what's going on in the ranks of the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. If you would like to join the ranks of the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network, you can do so at totalsoccershow.com slash subscribe. All the information is there, and we very much appreciate each and every person who subscribes. That we do. Um, I've also I've got some itchy feet requests. People waiting for their scouts. Just to let you know, those will be coming over the weekend when I find time to sit down and do some emailing. All right, Taylor Rockwell, thank you you for taking the time to talk to me today right back at you buddy listeners thank you for listening we're off to watch the Richmond Kickers in pre-season but we will talk to you very soon